Let's pray. Lord, uh, we come before you, Lord, this morning, Father God. We, we just want to thank you for your blessing, Father God. Thank you for your blessing that in our life, Father God. And Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, uh, who died in our sin, Father God. We love you, Lord. We want to praise you. We want to glorify you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
just the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation. You are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We give your all to us. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe your all to us.
You may be seated. Amen. That song got me uh, emotional. How great he is, and yet he, he chose us. Oh, Lord God, we thank you. 
triune God that you are, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, how great you are. And Lord, we know that you want to help us become warriors for your glory. You know how weak we are, Lord, but how strong you are. And Lord, we're thankful that you've chosen us to be your warriors. But Lord, we need some instruction on how to be strong spiritually. So we're thankful that we have your word. Your word that gives us all the instruction that we need to grow in grace. So we thank you for bringing us here this morning where we can worship you and get into your word. We ask you now to be our guide, that your Holy Spirit bring these words you've given us to life. Let us learn to apply them. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. How great is our God. <sighs> I could have sung at least 10 more songs. Alfredo and Shelly and Stephen, thank you so much. Uh, Stephen's here uh, because we're celebrating our 38-year anniversary, and so the family's going to come together at the end of the second service and celebrate our Debbie and mine uh, 30-year anniversary. But Daryl says that's no big deal. <laughs> Daryl, where are you at? How many you got? Ah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Why don't you come up here and teach on unity, would you? <laughs> that's a great... You got that right, bro. Ah, we're privileged to be able today to look into Ephesians chapter 4. Um, open your Bibles if you have your Bibles or get your phone ready. We're going to dig in here to 16 verses. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I told Daryl earlier I could have done three sermons on this passage. So I'm going to try to narrow it down to... Uh, 45 minutes, and uh, we're going to take a look at God's Word. Uh, the title of the sermon is, Let's Walk Together in Unity, Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. The question we're going to be answering, is unity in the church really possible? Is unity in the church really possible? I've been a part of I counted them, eight different churches, Uh, three before I was a pastor, and then five after pastoring for 40-plus years. Let's just put it this way. We need some instruction. Uh, Because, again, the, the person who hates the church the most is who? Yeah. And he will try anything and everything to cause division. And so we need instruction as the saints here at Bible Fellowship Church and as the church as a whole. And I think it's only apropos that we study this passage when you saints are in the midst of a pastor search. So I'll try to make some comments along those lines as we go along in our study here today. But we're going to break up this passage into four different parts. We're going to talk about the grace of unity, the ground of unity, the gifts for unity, and lastly, the growth of unity. Is unity in the church really possible? I want to draw your attention to verse 1. Therefore, and you are supposed to say what? Why is therefore, therefore? Right? I'll tell you why. 
Let's look at verse 20. After God gives the church in Ephesians this beautiful three chapters on doctrine, they're now going to be asked to apply the truth, the truths, the doctrines that they have been taught. Are they a little hesitant and discouraged? I think so. So, therefore, is going back to the doctrine, but also to verse 20. Look at verse 20. Now to him. No, we're going to read this together. Okay, ready? Now to him. I don't hear you. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to this part is good. According to the power, what, what's the Greek word for that? Come on, you heard it last week. Dunamis. We get our word dynamite. According to the dynamite, the power that works within every single saint. If you've asked Jesus Christ in your life, you're a saint. That's what we've learned here, haven't we? And then it says, to him be the glory. Where? Ecclesia, the called out one. If you're a saint, you are the church. Amen? So it says, to, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Those are encouraging words. Those, that's a promise from God. No, we're not able to bring about unity in the church. We're not. Because... We're all a bunch of, what are we? Sinners saved by grace. Broken people that have issues, right? Uh, uh, that's who we are. But we have a great God that brings us together with that power. So he goes on, verse four, uh, verse 1 in chapter 4. Therefore, you have all this doctrine. Now, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The church in Ephesus is given now the understanding that unity is, going to be, is, is provided by God, the God of grace. The God of grace. And we defined grace a while back as God's provision for every need when we need it. Does the church today need grace to be the powerful instrument that he's called us to be. Got your name in? Amen. Now, what gets in the way of us being those powerful warriors for Christ? <laughs> Take a look. Walking in a manner worthy of the calling, that's, we, we, we are to, to, to understand we've been called. We've been called. With which you have been called where were we called? Chapter 1, verse 4. We're told that we've been chosen. Not because of what we've done or what we've, but because of what he did. That's called God's grace. But, anyways, what gets in the way of us uh, having unity? Well, not experiencing the grace of God. Instead, being prideful. Here he says, we are to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. We are to walk in what? H word. Humility. Does it come natural for any of you to be humble? It doesn't come natural for me at all. Just ask my wife of 38 years. It doesn't come natural. But we are to understand that that is a key ingredient in the quest for unity in the church and in our homes, and wherever else. 
humility. Do any of us have humility? <laughs> uh, if you do, if you think you do, that means you don't, right? Uh, humility is something that is a tough one for all of us. And pride is the exact opposite of which creates not unity, but disunity, correct? Let me read to you. Uh, few doctrines are more important than this one, unity, because the church is under a ca uh, constant attack. We need to be good students of the subject of unity because we are fellow members of the body. We need to apply ourselves to mutual harmony. And because disease can diminish the effectiveness of the body, we must maintain, listen to this, habits of health and consistent program of exercising harmony with God's body-building program. Humility is a must for us to get a grip on. I liked what one scholar I had to say. He says, there are too many Christians today, I'm one of them, who have a pride of race, a pride of place, a pride of face, and even a pride of grace. <laughs> right? They are even proud that they have been saved by grace. Have you met those kind of people? Sometimes we call those people Bible thumpers. You know? You never know that they had any issues. You never know that they had weaknesses. Oh, that's called pride. C.S. Lewis called pride the great sin. And it's something that God lets us know from the very beginning. If we want unity, we have got to work on humility. Let me give you an example of that. This is kind of cool. Uh, there's a story of Beethoven's home in Germany. And there was a group of people who went to his home and they went into the different rooms. They had like a tour, right, into Beethoven's home. And at the one last room was where Beethoven played his piano. And so at the end of the lecture, the tour, whatever, they, they say, does anybody like to come up and just play a few chords? You know, come on up. So quite a few people went up and you know, played their. And there was one guy who didn't. He didn't go up there. And so the tour guy guy said, hey, why can't you just come up? He goes, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. You know who that was? Paderewski, however you say his name. That great pianist of all times. And yet he said, I'm not worthy. Is that humility? And in the church, we need men and women of God who demonstrate humility, as the word says here, with all humility and gentleness. I love this word, pratos, is the Greek word, pratos. It's, it's actually a picture of strength under control, right? Strength under control. Uh, like a wild horse that has been tamed and, and, you know, what do you call that word? The broken. A broken horse that, that can just, you know, really be out of hand, out of hand for a person, but, but, but they're, 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 they're kratos. They're gentle. Another word that's used there is meekness. Um, a picture also, I remember this picture. You ever seen a, a, a bigger dog with a little uh, yapper dog or a little puppy dog that just bites the legs of this big, massive dog? You know what I mean? Just bites it. You know, they're just, just a pain, right? Uh, that big dog could do what? One snap, and that little yapper would be history. Well, that's kind of the picture here. Uh, 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 we, are to be, we are to be Christians that have 
this power, this, this dunamis under control. Under control. So we don't have to be prideful. We, 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 we can be humble. We can be gentle. Look at the next word. Humility and gentleness with what? Patience. Patience. This is a hard one for me, and I'm sure it is for you, too. It's so easy to be impatient, isn't it? It's so easy to be impatient. Macrothumia is the Greek word for this, and it literally means long-tempered. Right? Long-tempered. How many of you are doing that? That just comes so easy. <laughs> I mean, some of you are going, what's the deal? Where's your pastor? Come on, search team. Do your job. No, you don't do that. The elders probably do that. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Patience. It, it's long-tempered. That produces unity. Tolerance. You know what that's about. It says here, showing tolerance for one another. What's the next word? Ah, in love. What kind of love are we talking about? We're talking about agape, aren't we? We're talking about agape. A love, God's love that is unconditional. Always accepting. And that's the kind of tolerance we're to show towards each other in the body of Christ. And that's also a difficult one, isn't it? Because I'm perfect and you guys are messed up. No, I mean, don't, we don't say that, but sometimes that's how we act, don't we? You know? Uh, and then we start comparing ourselves. I'm a very tolerant person compared to Brother, brother Harry. No, who are we to compare ourselves with? That's right. Almighty God. And his son, who demonstrated for us what tolerance was really all about when he was here on earth. Unity of the spirit is the last one that's mentioned here. Unity of the spirit. Being diligent. Oh, I love this word. Spudazo. I love saying some of these Greek words just to make me think I'm smart. But spudazo is the Greek word, and it, it literally means to make haste. To make haste. In other words, saints, let's just don't talk about humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance. Let's do it. Right? Make haste. It's diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's the grace. That's the grace that God provides for us to literally become humble and gentle and patient and tolerant. It, it's, it's, it's like this. All five essentials. Humility gives birth to gentleness. Gentleness gives birth to patience. Patience gives birth to tolerance. And tolerance gives birth to supernatural... Thank you. Unity. And I say supernatural because it is. Isn't it? It doesn't come natural. <laughs> but it can come supernatural if we experience the grace of God. Let's move on to the next uh, uh, two verses. Because now God takes us to the understanding that unity is grounded in, well, let me read it to you. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. Unity is grounded in the triune God. Follow me now. God the Father, found in verse 6. God the Son, in verse 5, Lord of one faith. And God the who? God the Spirit, in verse 4. There's our grounding. There's our foundation. When we look at God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, our minds just, we can't understand it. But it's foundational to understand that, that those three are one. 
They are unified as we read the scriptures. Unified like nothing we could ever understand. There's the unity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they are then creating the body, the hope, and the faith, and the baptism that we as saints experience. The ground or the, the, the foundation for purity. Let's move on. Next, we deal with verse 7 through 11, which we understand that God provides the gifts. He provides the gifts for a church that is unified. Let's read it, verse 7. But to each one of us, grace, it literally should mean the grace. You might want to put that in your Bible, the grace. In the original Greek text, it's the grace, not grace, but the grace, charis. But to each one of us, the church, the saints, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Uh, uh, real, real quick, God, God, God's a giver, <laughs> isn't he? God the Father, God the Son, God, they're, they're all givers. They love to give, as we know. Christ gifts. Therefore, it says, God says, and then he, he refers to Psalm 68, 18 here. When he ascended on high, here's the victory song. When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives. And he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended. See, when I'm sure when Paul was putting these words together through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Ascended came to his mind. And what did he think of? Ascended. Acts chapter 1. And so he goes on. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended. Acts chapter 1. Far above all the heavens so that he might feel all things. So he's referring to when Christ ascended, but he's also referring to when Christ descended from his preexistence with God the Father to come in the incarnation. And some scholars believe it also refers to First Peter, First uh, Peter chapter three, verse nineteen. But whatever it means, in the sense that Christ ascended, but he also, before he ascended, he descended in the incarnation to be with the saints, to be with the disciples. And when he ascended, then what happened? His omnipresence took over. And so how much better? So then he goes on to say, talking about the gifts for unity, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Then he, li he, he doesn't deal with the gifts that we read about in Romans chapter 12 or 1 Corinthians 12 uh, or 1 Peter even. He, he, then he, he, he's talking about the office bearers, the office bearers in the gifts that were given to the church. Take a look at the first one, verse 11. And he gave to the church some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and as pastors and teachers. We're not going to get into this. We could do a whole sermon on who the apostles were. But you know they, the apostles were chosen by God to do what? To build that foundation for the early church, to produce the scriptures that we now have in our hands. Very instrumental in the beginning of the church. Prophets, prophets were those men that would foretell, foretell, giving guidance to the early church. Who were the evangelists? 
they were what we would call the traveling missionaries. They were those who traveled everywhere, sharing the gospel. And lastly, pastors, teachers. Pastors, teachers. What's a pastor? A shepherd is a good word for that. A shepherd. And when you think of a shepherd, what do you think of a shepherd as far as their qualities go? They care they, to, to maintain stupid sheep. I don't know about that. I've just been told that sheep are stupid. And I look at me and I go, I'm one of them. <laughs> you know? But a shepherd cares for the sheep. And that's what a, a pastor does. A pastor isn't just a speaker, isn't just a teacher. A pastor is someone who wants to get to know y'all. That's why it's so hard to be a speaker. I, I, I'd much rather sit down with y'all and ask you how you're doing. What are your spiritual struggles? What can I pray for? I mean, that's what I'd prefer to do, you know? Find a pastor who loves God's word, not because they get up here on Sundays and preach, but they're, they're doing that in the morning or the evening in their home. There's one of your questions, Scott. Ask that person, what do you do in the morning besides brush your teeth and go to the bathroom? Right? Are you reading God's word? What are you reading? What are you applying? A man of God's word, right? A man of prayer. A man who doesn't get up here and just do long prayers, but a man who daily is on his knees praying for y'all, right? Have you been using that little prayer thing? Susan, I like it. Susan does a great job, doesn't she? Yeah, that, but, uh, but yeah. But that little prayer card, I've been, I, it's been fun praying for those needs. But find a, find a pastor that, 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 that doesn't just talk about prayer, but, but does pray. Yeah? Find a pastor who has suffered. And we need suffering. Find a pastor who, who, who can tell you about his temptations. Who can tell you about not just his strengths, but what are, what's your weaknesses? See, if we don't have in touch with our weaknesses, we're not going to be in touch with the rest of the weaknesses. Right? God wants us to be real. Find a pastor who's real. I love seminary. I, I went four years to a seminary. They, don't, they didn't teach us how to just really care for people. So what a shame that seminaries produce oftentimes men who are very knowledgeable. They can rattle off Greek words, Hebrew words. Well, I mean, they can wow you. But they, they don't care for who they're teaching. Yeah? You see what I'm saying? Uh, anyways, pastor teachers, are they important? Oh, they're very important. If you get the wrong one, kick them out. No, I'm just kidding. But, but it, it, it's hard. Uh, and by the way, here, don't put so much pressure on your pastor. You are the body of Christ. You are spiritually gifted with one or more gifts. Are you using those gifts? <laughs> I, I got a quote. I got to read to you. It's bad. You learn it, you're not going to like it. But, but here it is. Where is it at? I don't have it. You're lucky. No. <laughs> no, here, I can find it. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, oh, yeah, here it is. Here, check this out. You're not going to like it. Attendance is a poor substitute for participation in the ministry of God. Ooh. Mm. You know what they're saying. Get a part of a small group. You'll discover your, your, your gifts. 
just in fellowshipping with brothers and sisters in Christ. I know you don't, you can't have them right now, but get a part of a small group. Oh, let your pastor know that that you want to be of service for the glory of God. Oh, there's one more thing I wanted to say. Where is it? Uh, oh, come. Where is it? Pastor. Oh, yeah. Last week. I don't know, is it first or second of service? But some of you clapped after my whatever I, I sermon, my sermon was. You clapped. I'm going, <laughs> pastors don't get that. Now, speakers sometimes do, right? Not because I, yeah. The, when you get a pastor, the first time he preaches, clap. Uh, you don't have to clap after that, but just clap. You need to honor the pastor that God provides for you. Don't put him up on a pedestal, but honor him. Bless him. Support him. Get to know him. Well, here's this. Here's right here. He never asked me to go to my house. Never took me out to dinner. Never took me out to breakfast. You take him out to breakfast. You have him over for dinner and his family so you get to know the family. Yeah? Enough preaching. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, but anyways, the, the, the gifts for unity are, are so vital, so important here uh, that God puts these things down in black and white. And, and the apostles, the prophets, they're, they're no longer here. Uh, the evangelist is a different form of evangelism, but uh, pastors and teachers is a happening thing. Let's deal with growth, the growth of unity, the growth of unity. Here's what it has to say in verse 12. For the equipping of the saints, that's why these, these, these gifts were given uh, for the overseers, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, teachers. They were for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. God provides grace so that we grow. We spiritually grow. No one has arrived. Y'all understand that? If you're looking for a pastor that has arrived, don't don't get rid of him. We're all in process. We will arrive when we get to be with our Lord. But until then, we should have a passion to become Christ-like. To become Christ-like. Take a look. Verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, get that? To a mature man or woman, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. We want unity in the church. There's got to be an understanding that we are to imitate Christ. Verse 50, uh, verse, verse chapter 5, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says again, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you. Who's our model? Yep. Apostle Paul says it again, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Christ likeness. Does it come easy? Does it come easy to spend time in God's word? Does it come easy to have a time of prayer, one-on-one, daily devotions? Does it come easy to handle the testings that come our way, that test our 
lack of humility, our lack of gentleness, our lack of patience, our lack of tolerance. <laughs> I wish I would have wrote this quote down. You know, I'm a, what you, what you would call a perfectionist kind of a person. By the way, that's a sickness. Perfectionist. Uh, uh, that I like. If you looked at our drawers, uh, Debbie's drawer and my drawer, sweetheart, this is not I put down on you, but but everything is in line. My my <laughs> drawer, Debbie's drawer. <laughs> she's I'm the sick person. She's 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 the one who's well. Uh, but uh, perfection is not. Um, is not being exactly like Christ. Right? Christ's likeness is our goal. Christ's likeness is our is our, our, our pursuit. Not just because God loves to see his power work within us, but when we experience Christ's likeness, guess what? You have 50, how many years of marriage, bro? Or Daryl does. You have 46 years of marriage when you're pursuing Christ likeness. Huh? Huh? 63! <laughs> Bro, you come up here and teach it. <laughs> uh, that, that's a grace of God. And if you ask my bro here, he'll tell you that. That's a grace of God. But, anyways, Christ likeness. We need to strive for it in order to experience his love and his grace and his peace. Nothing better. Also, he gives a warning. So he deals with, you know, uh, growth in unity is going to happen when we're Christ-like, but it's also going to happen when we are what? When we're stable. He goes on to say in verse 14, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. I put in my Bible, false doctrine. By the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. Okay, now follow me here now. He's talking here now about what? Yeah, the enemy that is trying and, and, and is doing a good job in being deceitful Crafty and scheming. Um, I want to, and, and for us who want to be Christ like, sometimes we get tricked. Sometimes we get deceived, don't we? How many of you watched the movie The Shack? Yeah, I thought. I mean, it was a, it was a huge seller, wasn't it? I mean, it, it, well, where's my notes on that? Oh, here we go. I've got notes everywhere here. Uh, it was a powerful movie, not to mention it's a powerful book, and then they came out with a movie, and I remember watching it, and I'm watching it, and I'm going, wow. Mm. It was emotional. It was powerful. You remember the storyline, don't you? Uh, let me get real quick for those of you who didn't see it. Uh, the storyline is a little girl got kidnapped and killed. The father, his name was, uh, what was his name? His name was, uh, come on, help me. His name was Mac. Remember that? Missy was a little girl, his, his daughter. Mac was the father, and Mac wanted to do what? He wanted to kill the person who did this to his daughter. He was outraged. So again, you know the story. He went, and, and, and in the mailbox was a letter from God. And God said, come to the shack. He went to the shack. I'm really mad. I'm fast-forwarding. But he came to the shack, and he met who? He met the Trinity. Remember that? He met the Trinity. There was the father whose name was Papa, who was a black African woman. Then there was the son, Jesus, who was a Mideasterner, a carpenter. And then there was the Holy Spirit, uh, who was uh, what? Oh, yeah, it was an Asian. 
lady. Now, what? I mean, I'm not going to get into picking it apart, right? But, but here's what happened. They had conversations. Remember that? They had conversations about heavy stuff, about evil, about sin, about death, uh, uh, about the, the nature of God. Remember that? And then there was one point where it was really critical. Uh, Mac asked Papa if God is only reconciled to those who believe in Jesus. Remember that? I don't know if you remember that. I didn't remember it either. But, but here's how Papa responded. She said, the whole world, Mac. The whole world, Mac. Now, what does that mean? If you have correct doctrine, you right away realize that, wouldn't it? That's universalism. Everybody goes to heaven. Right? Did you all have that, that, that kind of, maybe you didn't, pick apart that part, but, but did y'all have that kind of like, I got red flags. I hope so. The enemy is deceitful. The enemy is tricky. Three years later, the author, William Paul Young, who wrote the book, came out with a book called The Lies People Believe About God. Three years later, then he expounds on universalism. A false teacher. God is warning the church to don't fall into every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. That's when division can occur in a church when you have immature spiritual believers who get caught up in false doctrine. Then he goes on to say the growth of unity. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Truth joined with love. Sound doctrine is needed in the church. But truth without love is what? A bunch of Bible thumpers. Love without truth is what? False teachers, here we come. So he lets the readers know, by the way, there's no clock today. I got a watch. What, what time we got? Okay. Okay, I got it. Okay, good. Uh, you can't separate truth and love if you want unity in the church. Right? You got to have truth and you got to have love. They're together. They're unified. But what happens when we get all prideful? Oh, I'm right, you're wrong. Boom, oh, my Bible says, uh, bop. you know, you know what I'm talking about. Oh. Truth and love go together. And I just know that Cooperation begins with a head. Let's read about it. Cooperation. From whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in what? In love. In love. Who's the head of the church? We get our directives from him. 
Então, we're the body. We are to be involved in all these things we've been talking about today. We should be excited to say, yep, the God's grace is going to bring about humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance. God, God's unity is, is here because we believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We've got a foundation. We believe that pastors, we're going to get a pastor, maybe pastors. When I was here for 12 years, uh, I think I told some of you, uh, uh, we had a search team, and we didn't know. Well, two guys came up to the top. Remember that, Aaron, Gary? Two guys. We couldn't. We went, they're both great. We want both of them. So guess what? We hired both of them. You don't know what God's going to do. But 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 God, if you listen to the head of the church, He's going to make it very clear. But your pastor teacher is the one he has chosen. Now, it may take some time. And if there's one elder that says, no, I don't think so, stop the process, Daryl. Because we make decisions in unanimity, consensus. You're still doing that, right? Okay. Because we all have the same Holy Spirit. And we will come to a one-mindedness as we seek the head of the church. I'm excited for y'all. I am. I'm excited for y'all because I, I, this is my home church for, for 12 years. And I'm confident that God is going to bring to you a great pastor. In fact, I'm going to come when, when he comes. Okay? But, but a, a, a pastor who, who he understands unity, Amen? And I'm going to pray for you that you don't depend on the pastor to make unity happen. You make it happen. Yeah? You're the body. And he, he is too. He's just another part of the body. Let's pray. Oh, God, we're humbled. As I came up here this morning, I got all emotional because of I'm thankful that you chose me. And I pray that every saint here is humbled by the fact that you chose them also, Lord. And now, Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who has not heard your voice and has not followed you, I pray that they would make a decision today to accept your grace, your love, the forgiveness of their sin, and become a saint themselves. But Lord, we're thankful that you've chosen us. And we're thankful, Lord, that we don't have to follow these instructions without the help of your all-powerful Holy Spirit, your all-powerful uh, word that gives us everything we need to be spiritually mature. So help us as our quest to be Christ-like. Help us, Lord. We need your help. And we thank you for Ephesians 3.20 that says, Now to him who is what? Able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. According to what? According to the power that works within us. To God be the glory in the church and what? And in Christ Jesus. To what? To all generations. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.